mom when faced with the difficulties of parenting a young teenage son with a substance use problem. She decided to learn as much as she could about the condition of adolescent addiction and help her family and other parents and their young adults. Ginny writes a weekly blog for the Boise High Brave Parents newsletter. It's called Blinders Off. And all her articles and resources are available online for no cost at blinderoff.com. She also advocates for better treatment for this chronic condition and speaks openly to reduce the stigma that keeps many parents holding this secret in shame and fear. One of the reasons she's willing to speak candidly is because she experienced that fear um, can take over, which also often gives way to denial, anger, and frustration. She hopes that by sharing her story about parents, uh, babe, parents may more clearly evaluate what may be going on before their eyes and reach for resources and react more quickly to help their young person. Ginny believes there is reason for hope. She has seen many family situations improve and the tra trajectory of the young person change for the better when the entire family gets involved in learning about substance use disorder. So before we turn to Ginny, I just want to remind everyone that we do have a 1-866 number that you can call in um, to ask any questions that you might have for Ginny, as well as on your computers, please turn off your mics because you might get some feedback if you have that on. So thank you for joining us today and I will turn it over to Ginny. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. Um, my talk is really gonna be a narrative story about what addiction in a junior year looks like across the kitchen counter from it won't be loaded with statistics. I'm really going to give you more the texture of our daily life to help you evaluate what's going on in your home. I'm going to share our family story about having a young son develop a substance use disorder at the age of 13. And I call it a substance use disorder because that's what it is. It's a disorder of the thinking processes and the pleasure center of the brain. And the earlier they begin this exposure to alcohol or other drugs, the higher likelihood they are of developing substance use disorder at some time in their life. Um, I use the word substance use disorder rather than addiction because addiction has such a negative stigma and it holds such powerful negative images for people. And I think that people are frightened when they um, encounter somebody that's severely suffering and they need to find help for a family member. So they tend to stay in denial and secrecy and shame for a longer period of time and not reach out for help. So I want to use the word substance use disorder and speak about it as a chronic disease state that affects the willpower and the thinking processes of someone rather than a moral shortcoming. Um, oftentimes the behaviors of someone in active use are difficult to live around and I understand that. Sometimes they're even crimin criminal and that can be very difficult for a family. But just like any other chronic disease, um, we would not incarcerate or punish someone for that, but rather we would try and find them treatment. And I believe that brain science is really coming um, to the forefront in how to treat this disease differently. Um, I believe that it's a disease that can be treated with early intervention, and it's important to get, um, treat, get your son or daughter to treatment early to avoid a greater de derailment or a possible impairment. If a young person begins using alcohol or other drugs as early as 13 years old, they have a one in six chance of developing a lifetime substance use disorder. Imagine that. S imagine your son or daughter with their six friends, and one of them, if they all become partiers at 13 to 14 years old, one in six or more um, will develop a substance use disorder. In our son's case, um, Kids who use are generally attracted to each other. They don't use in a vacuum. It's kind of a cultural thing, and it snowballs and builds on itself. So it was more like a 50% uh, permeation of a problem with substance use in his group, in his peer group. And if a young person delays their first use till they're 17, that statistic goes down to one in seven. And if they delay their first use until 21 years old, they join the rest of the population, which um, statistically is said to have a 9 to 10 percent um, occurrence of a genetic predisposition to develop addiction. Um, by the way, marijuana is an addictive substance. 
Um, I know that with the legalization of it, that a lot of parents really have ambivalence or questioning about this, but marijuana is indeed addictive. And there's plenty of research to support that, and I'll supply that in a reference list at the end of my talk. Um, this webinar will not explain how to better talk to your young person. That's the topic for next month's webinar. It's about communication with a teenager. Um, I cannot predict the trajectory of your young person based on 10 points of evaluation or tell you if you need to seek professional help. What I can do is candidly tell you the story um, of what our family went through and help you frame what may be going on in your, pers your young person's life and your family. You may be very different, or there may be some similarities. You may hear things and think, oh, our situation isn't nearly that bad. And for some of you, unfortunately, you may hear things and swear that I am standing in your kitchen listening to your family because our situations are so identical. I will fill in the texture of our daily life, what it looked like from my vantage point, and how each of us in the family was molded by this condition in one of our members. Um, they say addiction is a family disease, and they're right. As, a, as the addict in the family gets sicker, so does the whole family system. Um, hopefully my narrative will help you decide how much of what you're seeing falls within the normal limits of adolescent angst, hormone storms, and the average pushing for independence. As I tell my story, you may be looking for the one error, the one piece of dysfunction, um, or a weakness in our family, the one thing that you do differently that explains why ours, we had a son that became so affected by drug use and you're hoping that yours won't. And that's okay. We were average parents and I do hope you learned something um, from this talk. I'm going to share all the warts and bumps because I want other parents to learn from our mistakes and not feel embarrassed about their own. And I want you to become more educated on this topic. Could we have prevented our son's eventual addiction to substances? I'm not sure. Our family has a strong genetic predisposition to um, addiction and the disease of depression. Uh, uh, sorry, and the disease of depression. But we sure as heck could have realized sooner and gotten him into treatment earlier, and not almost broken up our marriage over this. So we have two sons. Um, the age separation is three years. The older one went directly through high school with awards and good grades. He went on to college and he now is on to a job and self-supporting at the age of 24. Um, so whenever I start beating myself up about having a son that has had these difficulties and taking some blame on myself, I remind myself that we raised two sons in the same house with the same parents. Um, both of our sons were in a lot of sports. We skied, we whitewater rafted as a family. Um, we had pets and birthday parties and sleepovers, and we had dinner most nights of the week together. Um, I volunteered at their schools, we had curfews, we set limits. We tried our best to keep track of our sons, and we were average, attentive parents. Um, our son, who became affected by substance use, was a fun, vibrant little golden-haired boy. Um, he had a heart of a lion as a youngster. He was a daring acrobat, and he was a stupendous athlete. He played up a year in soccer, and he dove the Great Barrier Reef when he was only 11 years old. Um, he was a good student, and he was well-liked. He had a lot of friends. He was funny and endearing in his love for his 30 chickens and 11 ducks. He ran a little egg business out of our house. We had dogs and cats. He had hedgehogs, a boa constrictor. Um, and the dogs treated him like a litter mate, and he and his brother wrestled like puppies. Um, but he was a handful. Even from preschool, he was a challenging person. Um, he would push the limits, he would take liberties, challenging authority, and he appeared to be fearless when it came to speed and heights. Um, there was one day that he rode his bike down the steep hill on his way to school so fast um, that he came out of control and hit the back of a parked car. Um, broke his nose and his kneecap and had a lot of abrasions. And neighbors told me after that that they had seen him flying down that road for weeks, um, banking around the corner, nearly turning, nearly leaning his body completely over. And so he was very coordinated, and he did take a lot of uh, risks. He would jump, um, build jumps off a tree for it and land on the trampoline. Um, one time, I remember, he wanted to build a zip line from his second story bedroom window and have it go out over the pool and drop off. And I actually considered it. 
because these were active young boys and I expected some broken bones and stitches. This is what raising boys is about, right? Um, what I did not expect was the summer between the seventh and eighth grade was to find a bong, that's a apparatus used for smoking marijuana. I found a bong buried deep in his closet the day after a sleepover when he'd had five of his closest friends over. Um, we expected something like this sooner or later. Um, we, we thought we'd be challenging the um, we'd be facing the challenge of high school partying and girls, but 13 seemed awfully young. Um, and what we came to learn, and I've mentioned before, that when it begins this young, they have a one in six chance of developing addiction. This is something I didn't know at the time. So my husband and I, after finding the bong, we talked about it, and we took him up to the banks of our favorite river where we kayaked together, and we sat down, and we had a real earnest heart-to-heart. Um, we were understanding but firm, we were very clear um, that this was not going to be allowed and what we mainly talked about was the damage that this could cause to his brain, um, change the trajectory of his life, um, and that we understood that these substances, that there was curiosity, that um, he might have some thrill seeking, that he was, you know, feeling peer pressure, and that um, having this, um, oh, this, um, we call it this image of being the drug, whiskey druggy boy, that that might be appealing and that he might be getting pressure from his friends. And we talked about how he could handle that in his group. Um, and by the end of this conversation, he was in tears and he was genuinely sad to have disappointed us. And his intention was to do better and stay away from drugs and alcohol. Then we called the other parents um, to let them know that their five sons had been sleeping over their house. And we got varying responses, and we were really pretty shocked by some of them. Um, one father told us um, his son would not do that. He was certain that he was only watching. Well, okay. Um, his son had been at our house two weekends in a row to sleep over, and we found the lawn. Um, sure, maybe he was only watching at this time, but he certainly hadn't removed himself or spoken up. Um, one mother kind of brushed it off and said, well, they're all going to experiment. It's only pot, and after all, we smoke pot in our day. And this is a common response that I um, hear from parents. She was almost a little conspiratorial in her laugh about it. Um, sure, we all smoke pot in our day was her response. Yeah, we may have. You know what? It wasn't a very good idea. And also, this is not the marijuana of our adolescence. This marijuana is on average seven to 10 times stronger than anything we ever encountered. And the psychological effects of it are much more severe. I kind of liken it to having your first beer or drinking white lightning. Um, one father, this was the most disheartening response. He wanted to know adamantly, where did this pot come from? Where were the kids getting it? And we told him that our intention was not to get somebody in trouble, that marijuana was ubiquitous, we realized that. What we wanted to do was get together as a group of parents and help these youngsters um, take a different direction. What we came to find out, find out later was that it was an older son of this family that was giving these 13-year-old brothers um, the pot and the alcohol. And that the parents were aware of this. They were mainly interested that their older son not get in trouble. It was really disheartening, and we continued throughout our son's remainder of his time at home to turn a blind eye and allow the kids to smoke pot and drink in their house. Um, a lot of parents feel that by the time that they're adolescents that we don't really have much input. We do. Parents do have an impact. Um, children whose parents adamantly and repeatedly talk to them about the dangers of marijuana and alcohol and set clear limits are less likely to imbibe. At this point, what I wish I'd had was the courage to educate myself more and share this openly with other parents and to insist that this group of parents get together and speak. I was off put by a lot of the responses and we all kind of went into a silent, um, almost secretive state of keeping our own children's confidences, not reaching out to each other, um, blaming other children, targeting, you know, that's the bad child, um, my son wouldn't do that. And the truth was, these were all close friends. They were all engaged in it. They were all very interested in drugs and alcohol and thrill-seeking. Um, and they had their own culture. You, children don't use in a vacuum. Teenagers um, get into this by their, by their peer group. Um, what else did this look like? 
Well, this was the summer that the boys started wanting to drop out of all the sports that they had previously had found very exciting, like soccer or ski racing. They just wanted to hang out. And just hang out meant uh, no occupation or purpose in the gatherings. They'd go to a gas station and just hang out, or the skateboard park and hang out and smoke pot in the bathroom, um, or meet up at a local park. Um, but they wouldn't bring a frisbee or a ball. They were just meeting up and hanging out. This was um, really kind of perplexing to us because previously this had been a very busy group of boys. Excuse me. So the way that we responded is we really stepped up our parenting game. game. We became more vigilant, and we insisted that he go to a sport, or one would be picked for him. And that summer, we really fought. But we also took some wonderful family rafting trips, and we went back east to a large extended family vacation on the beach. And that all seemed to help, time away from friends and more time with the family. And then he, that fall, when the eighth grade year began, he met a girlfriend and she was a wonderful influence on him. She was still interested in doing fun things, um, hanging out with the family, which was okay with her, and she resisted a lot of the more precocious friends and pulled him in a different direction. She valued school and she wanted to do well. Her parents were vigilant and they wanted to meet us and they checked up on her whereabouts frequently. She had a curfew. Um, and we, as a family, really enjoyed a pretty nice eight months or so. He was smitten with her, he was cheerful, he was back to skiing, and he was softer about following our family rules. Um, and he was not as um, defiant with us. Um, we thought at that point that, okay, he's on a better trajectory, which we, what we didn't realize is that when he was 13, he had already begun to develop this chronic substance use disorder. He was already tipping over the scale of becoming addicted. And we thought that if he could stop using for several months, well, that meant that he didn't have a problem. And what we've come to learn is that people with an addiction problem often can white knuckle it. They can stop for several months, especially if there's something extremely pleasurable, like new love coming into the scene that makes it um, more appealing to remain sober. Um, so we were totally taken off guard when the old friends started showing up <clears throat> and I'd overhear them pressuring him that um, he was whipped by this girl and um, that they really wanted him back in their social club and if he was a man, he wouldn't be letting her rule his life, things like that. And it wasn't just them, he was seeking them out. I wanna be clear of that. He wasn't, um, he wasn't being taken advantage of. His addiction was um, rising to the surface again. And um, so he dumped this girlfriend rather precipitously and it was really puzzling to us um, because they had been having so much fun and he did seem to be so taken with her. Um, and then she did something that was rather remarkable for a 15 year old. She took an awful chance by asking to meet with me. I almost didn't meet with her because my feeling was not to get involved in you know, his romantic life, keep my, keep my boundaries. Um, but she told me it wasn't about their having broken up. And when I got together with her, um, she said to me, he was tired of trying and that he was going to let himself go. And I'll never forget those words when she said them because um, it was as if I was having a premonition of what was to come. I felt this incredible dread in my stomach drop. He's going to let himself go and you have to do something. That's what she said to us. Um, that cost her a lot socially at school to have come forward and told me that. Um, but I really honor that she did because once the switches trip toward addiction, um, without some treatment, without some concerted efforts, and family support, and probably professional support, the person is going to be able to turn it around. And that was the case with our son. So I shared this with my husband and the counselor that we had our son seeing at that point, and neither one of them really thought much of this. Um, but I'll never forget the dread I felt when I heard it. Um, he'd been hanging on to his sobriety, they call it white knuckling, and he'd been able to because of this intense pleasure of having a first love. But the cravings um, did work their way to the surface again. His old friends were beckoning and uh, he was back in the clan and becoming a druggy boy again. And that's just what ensued. And the next year was real hell. Um, there was many trips to the counselor for him and us. My husband and I began fighting about who knew the right way to handle this? Um, 
who had mishandled the last confrontation, were we being clear enough in our rules, and our son was manipulating and splitting hairs to convince us that he, that he had a re reasonable loophole in some of our rules. An example of this would be, I previously stated that if he were late again, if he lied again, um, that he would be grounded and he would split hairs about what does, what does being late mean. Um, it was a lie of omission, it wasn't an actual lie, he just didn't tell us something. And these kind of things, and he would split, us, um, split my husband and I from each other on our point of view of how to handle it. He was masterful at it, as most of these kids are. Um, there'd be tearful, raging arguments with him when he'd come in late, obviously stoned, and I'd confront him. And initially, um, my partner thought I was the problem, that I was not saying things properly or clearly enough, that I was aggravating the situation. Um, and he had mixed feelings about me searching this kid's room and backpack. Um, this is something that we had not done before, but in light of what he was up to, it seemed reasonable to me that he had earned this, um, by his actions and that by being a vigilant parent, we really did need to know what was going on for his health and safety. So when I would find something, which I often did, and we would confront him about the drugs and paraphernalia I was finding, <clears throat> he of course would become very volatile. What are you doing looking in my things? You have no right, I have no privacy. It's no wonder I'm having such a hard time. You guys put so much pressure on me. You parents are the wax. Um, my other friend's parents don't do this. What's wrong with you? I can't wait to get out of this house. When I'm 18, I'm leaving and I'm not going to ever see you again. Things like that. It was very hurtful. It was upsetting. Um, and it would split my husband and I. Um, we would um, confront each other during some of these, argue about how to handle it, what the consequences would be. And believe me, when we did that, our son would um, drive a dump truck through that wedge. These were really hard times. Um, the counselor had been seeing him for about 15 months at this point, and he did not pick up on um, that this kid had addiction. He knew he was using, um, but he did not label it as a substance use disorder or think that this was the primary problem. Um, our son was so depressed during this time that he could not stop using. He actually said to some of his friends, and he told us this later in treatment, that he said to his friends, hey, I, I think I might have this addiction thing. And his friends chided him out of it, kind of made fun of him and said, no, you don't. Um, and they encouraged him, they egged him on to continue to take more pills at parties and drink until he blacked out and mix multiple substances. And he was the risk-taking one, so he did. Um, and he told us all this the following year. He also, during this time, um, told some friends that he was considering suicide. And these young people did not know how to react to that. Um, they didn't know that they needed to tell his parents they, um, or tell their own parents or get help for him. So they just talked about it amongst themselves and uh, decided that he really didn't mean it. He was just attention seeking. Uh, boy, I felt just sick when I heard that um, later on when he was in treatment. Um, during this time, I recall, he felt ill most of the time. He had a lot of somatic complaints. My stomach hurts, I think I have bronchitis. Um, I think I have allergies. Um, he wanted to have a mood light because he was having difficulty staying awake in school and he thought that if he had a mood light in the morning that um, he wouldn't be so down in the winter. He wanted to take vitamins and he wanted to st start seeing a dentist more regularly because he had developed a teeth grinding and a nail biting habit. His complexion got worse and he craved sweets. He used to drink chocolate milk by the gallon. And he started wanting coffee in the morning to get going. Um, the energy drinks weren't popular yet, but all these other artificial ways to stimulate um, became apparent. Um, so how did this all look in his peer group? Um, this group of kids is quite different than our older son's peer group. As early as the sixth grade, they began challenging the playground monitor. Um, taunting her and um, directly disobeying school rules just to see if they could get her goat. And also there was a reaction in the parent group that was pretty alarming. When I look back now, um, that was really, for, really our first sign as parents that our own peer parents weren't really going to be there for us when our son was in the middle school and high school years and these bigger issues came up. Um, because a lot of parents 
back their kids when the principal and the school um, playground monitor told them about their sons and daughters' behaviors and asked for them to intervene. And the parents blamed the playground monitor and backed their children. Some of them even um, asked the principal to ask the playground monitor to not talk to their children anymore, that she was just making things worse. Um, if there's ever a time that a high school principal or um, a teacher calls you and tells you they're concerned that your child may be using drugs, please make your first response, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to let me know so I can help my child. All your other fears and distress will come to the surface. Um, you may immediately feel like denying it and saying, no, my son or daughter wouldn't do that, or questioning, do you really, do you, how do you know? And that's okay, ask your questions. But at the end of the conversation, repeat, thank you for telling me, and take that information to heart. Other grown-ups aren't making this stuff up about your kids. When we called the other parents and told them we found a bomb in our son's closet after the sleepover, we didn't enjoy doing that. We weren't pointing the finger at their child. We really were just trying to align ourselves as a group of parents um, to be more effective with our children, keep them safer. Um, also what it looked like was from the girls, um, from the vantage points of, of the girls, girls became um, very secretive. The boys may have become more uh, challenging and to authority, more moody, um, just laying around more. But the girls became very secretive and began dressing much more seductively than the average seventh and eighth grader. Um, I remember one time when they came to our house to get desk dressed for the uh, junior high school dance, and the girls went out of the house dressed pretty okay, according to the school um, you know, dress code. When they got to the dance, they stripped down to leotards with thongs on top, and push-up bras and camisoles that showed just about everything but the nipples. Um, it was pretty bad, and the boys adapted the garb of gangsters and druggies. Um, emblems of pot leaves, magic mushrooms, um, words like acid and uh, lightning bolts started showing up as doodles on the textbooks, writing with ink on their hands. I remember one time I was driving the boys up to the local ski area and one kid got in with these gloves on and had a huge pot leaf emblem on the top of the ski gloves. And I asked him, where did you get those? And is it all right with your mother be wearing them? Asked him to go in the house and change them. And his response that his mother knew that she bought these for him online. Um, when they start researching things on the internet and they start doodling in their notebooks and keeping uh, banners and drug paraphernalia um, posters around their bedrooms, take note. This really is part of the whole culture and they're letting you know that they're acutely interested. If they begin um, defending marijuana adamantly, if they begin researching it. I remember um, looking at our internet history and my son had extensively researched ethnobotanicals is what he, how he referred to um, plant-based drugs, um, things like hallucinogenic mushrooms and marijuana. Um, heck, he'd never researched a paper that thoroughly in his life, but what he'd researched about marijuana and magic mushrooms, how to get them, how to grow them, and it was impressive. Um, one of his friends even got a post office box and had a synthetic THC product called Spice mailed to it. Um, he kept a safe in his room. He was selling drugs out of his bedroom and out of his post office box. Um, they did this because at the time, they found out on the internet that we couldn't test for this synthetic material called the spice or the bath salts. And the bath salts and spice had not been outlawed yet. Um, I remember going to his classroom one time and there was a poem. Um, creating writing class teacher put a poem up on the wall that each of the kids had written. Um, earlier that semester, and his poem began with the three words, spills, thrills, and pills. Uh, I was really shocked. Um, shocked that he had written that, it was right out in public, and also alarmed that the teacher had never brought this to my attention, this had been written two months earlier. He became very sullen and moody, as I mentioned, he had a lot of somatic complaints, the stomach aches, the chronic sore throat, he thought he had allergies, the sniffling nose, um, there was a day on the trampoline one summer day when I was going to take this group of boys up kayaking on the Payot River, and instead they were down on the trampoline moaning that they thought they all had stomach poisoning and they had um, headaches, and they gave up a day of kayaking to lay down in the shade on the trampoline. This wasn't like this group of kids to do this, and they all had the same suspicious stomach bug at the same time, although they'd all come from separate homes that morning. 
a bit being really disrespectful and secretive, um, really quite nasty um, with parents. And the more vigilant I became keeping track of them at our house, the less likely they were to come and hang out there. Um, I was the parent who became too vigilant, so they chose to go somewhere else. Um, they be he began lying about where he was. There were elaborate ruses about um, stories about parents are at home and what they were going to be doing there and how the parents were going to be involved. And what was really going on um, was there was a concerted effort to find out who didn't have a parent home in that house, to go to that house, and they were doing drugs and having inebriated sex and getting dangerously drunk and high on a multitude of drugs. Um, there were magic mushrooms, LSD, molly, which is a slang word for ecstasy, um, marijuana, spice, alcohol, and prescription drug, um, prescription pills that weren't prescribed to them all at these parties. And you may wonder, well, where were they getting these prescription pills? Um, one instance was a friend of my son's broke his wrist in a skateboarding accident. And when my son was actively using, he went over to visit his friend. I remember he made him bring him homemade cookies that we made for him. Um, but he went over and he took most of this kid's Vicodin. Um, the kids frequently found drugs in their grandmother's or mother's um, medicine cabinet left over from a back surgery or a hysterectomy. Um, some parents keep marijuana in their bedside stand. Uh, the kids thought that was a big joke, that they were actually using one mother's marijuana. They were tapping into her supply. And then there are the stories about losing things. Now, all kids lose things, but our son was losing his ski goggles, his headphones, his new hoodie, um, his lunch money. Um, he was coming home famished from school when supposedly he'd been buying school lunches. And he told me that the portions were so small that he had to buy um, several portions to get full. So he was having overdraft notices from the lunch lady. And what we came to find out was he wasn't losing things. He was hawking them, trading them for drugs. Um, and his lunch money, he was um, buying other people lunch in return for drugs and foregoing eating on his own. So he would return home just famished at the end of the day. Uh, his breath smelled funny. His art teacher called me that he and a group of his friends were making, um, we're making these three-dimensional vessels in class. And she said, it's funny, but they all resemble some type of bomb. Again, that's that paraphernalia that they used to smoke marijuana. It's a tube. And anyways, they were all making bombs, and the art teacher told me um, that this is what they were doing. He was missing assignments, and the whole bunch of them were banned from the next school dance because they had been dirty dancing at the previous school dance. Um, then the sneaking out began sneaking out at night, even when he wasn't having a group sleeping over on his own. One morning, we found his bicycle outside the garage, and his backpack um, was on the ground beside his bicycle. It hadn't been there the night before, so I picked it up, and in it was an empty bottle of liquor and a girl's hat. Um, I called the girl whose mother, I called the girl's mother, and that girl had also been having um, a sleepover that night, but she really didn't think that the girls had snuck out. Um, so this began all in the 7th and 8th grade, and there's one thing I can say about sleepovers is they should be done <laughs> in elementary school. Sleepovers in the junior, junior high and high school years really just allow too much middle-of-the-night exposure to each other when they're really tempted to do things without good judgment and no adults around. Um, sleepovers have a place when you're going out of town and that uh, friend can't return home. But um, I've talked to many, many parents where sleepovers were the first exposure to drug use, um, the source of um, being able to get really, really high for the night and go unobserved and unaccountable. Um, and our son became desperate to get, out of, to get out of the house. He was cutting the screens as we turned the alarm system on in the house to notify us if he had opened a window. Um, he was cutting hole in the screens in the bathroom so that we could smoke pot um, up in his bathroom by sticking the joint out the window. He had mood swings. Um, he'd come in whistling and singing and all goofy one moment, and then he'd be so tired an hour later that he had to nap all afternoon. Um, he had big depressions and periods of uh, just terrible irritability. He had a persistent cough and red eyes. He often had visine in his backpack, and he usually walked in the door chewing spearmint gum and avoiding eye contact. Um, and then began the elaborate excuses. I'd find an empty bottle in his backpack, 
And he would confide in me. He'd say, it's not mine. I have that backpack. I, I have that bottle of liquor. I'm holding it for two girls. Um, they brought it to the party, and I thought they were getting too drunk, so I took the bottle to keep them safe. Um, and then telling you stories about how bad the other kids are. The other kids are mixing alcohol and prescription pills. I would never do that. The friends that I'm bringing around now, they're really the good kids. Um, they don't do drugs. Uh, he used to smoke pot. Yeah, you heard right. He used to smoke pot, but he stopped completely. And his parents are testing him now. And what I would say to you as a parent is it's not that you're going to find the one kid that's the, trouble, uh, the troublemaker or the one that's bringing the drugs in and be able to annihilate uh, that association. It's the whole culture of kids. Um, if your son or daughter isn't actively moving away from a group of young people that's actively using, then they are moving toward it if they're not already involved. A kid who really is avoiding it doesn't stay in this group. So if they're in the group, they're part of it. And if you aren't drug testing them, you really can't say you know what's going on. A lot of parents make the mistake of thinking because nothing bad has happened for a while that they can forget about the marijuana they're finding in the backpack, um, the time that he got drunk two weeks ago and the soccer coach called you. If you aren't testing and vigilant, you really don't know. Um, the average young person in treatment um, reveals that they used, on average, two and a half years before their parents or teachers realized they had a serious drug problem. They become very adept at hiding it and manipulating you to think it's something else or distracting you um, so that you'll focus on something else. Um, arguments like um, angry outbursts and blaming us. Um, it was his stupid teacher's fault. We were the reason he was smoking pot to relieve his stress. If we would just back off, um, he would feel less stressed and he wouldn't need to smoke pot. Um, there would be spontaneous combustion over um, being asked to take a drug test. Um, that's something I don't recommend doing in your home um, if you're going to be doing it for an extended period of time, which I do recommend, is to keep at it, not just for weeks, but months. And if you consider the expense of a drug test as compared to the expense of treatment, I'll just say to you, if your son or daughter had a virus that you had to test at regular intervals to make sure that they were recovering from it, you would go to any expense, and this is no less life-threatening um, than a serious virus. Um, he researched on the internet, and I would notice that when it had been a reasonable interval between the last drug test and he suspected that another one was coming, or we would tell him another one was coming, he'd begin to flush with huge amounts of liquid. All of a sudden, the Gatorade would be missing from the refrigerator. Um, he'd be chugging gallons of water that day, trying to dilute his test. Um, the arguments, the other parents don't care, you guys are out of hand, and I can quit any time. This was something that he always threw in our face. I can quit any time. My drug tests have been negative for months now, and still you persist. Um, it was looking at the constellation of all the behaviors that was going on. It wasn't just whether his drug tests were negative or not. It was, was he sneaking out? Was he lying about his whereabouts? Was he moody and irritable, really unreasonably moody and irritable? Um, were new friends showing up that were a little seedy? Um, he stopped taking care of his chickens. Um, he started losing some of his long-term friends. His behavior was even too much for some of them. He became short-tempered with the dog, which was something this kid had never been. He showed up a few times with bruises on his face. And he didn't tell us the truth. He was having fights at school about, I don't know if it was about drug deals, but he was having fights at school, and that wasn't like him. There was two final incidents that really pushed my husband and I over the edge to finally take our blinders off and face what was going on. Um, there was a car crash um, in which he left the scene of an accident and then lied about it for two days. Um, that was very serious. And then um, he was riding his bicycle downtown, and he was so high that he ran into a concrete light pole, knocked himself over, and bent the bike. And a complete stranger that witnessed this got out of his pickup truck, picked him up and his bicycle, and brought him home, and knocked on the door. And my husband stayed up the next 10 hours watching him breathe and debating if he should take him to the hospital or not. Those were, um, really, we began seeing that his life was in danger, 
And this was really rough on us as a couple. This was a really rough time. And if there, you ever have a festering issue in your marriage, there is nothing like a child with a severe emotional condition to bring that all to a head. They will challenge you to your wit's end. <clears throat> and our son could be, in turn, very persuasive and charming. He would um, um, engage with one of us to gain favor and be absolutely oppositional and awful with the other parent and then pit us against each other. Um, I remember one particular time that um, one of us felt that he had served his consequence of being grounded long enough. Um, I think he's learned his lesson. He's doing really well now. Did you hear how mature and considerate he just was, he just was with me? I think he's learned his lesson. I, I, I don't think we need to keep this whole period of isolation going. Um, the other parent would feel pretty hurt by this. They'd feel um, that um, the consequences weren't being enforced, that he had earned these consequences fair and square, and that the other parent wasn't backing them. And this can really cause a divide between the parents and a lot of resentment. Um, and as soon as a person with substance use disorder can deflect the attention away from their use, and get the parents fighting, well, that's game on for them. And they can effectively keep their drug use going and keep you on edge, keep you your disequilibrium going, and take the attention off them. Hair splitting was a big one. Um, well, you said I had to be in by curfew. You didn't say I couldn't be outside somewhere on our property. So we'd come home on time and then sneak back out and be down in the deep recesses of our backyard, smoking pot in the dark with friends who had showed up. Um, technically, he was home by curfew. <laughs> uh, he'd argue that he misunderstood what I was saying about being at someone else's house with the parent has to be home if you're going to be there. Well, she was there when I got there, but then she left for the evening. So, uh, technically, she was there. Um, and the other parent would then question, well, you, did you say it clearly enough? Did you say it explicitly enough? Are you really... Um, causing some of this problem by how of, of how argumentative he's becoming because you're really aggravating the situation. And what I'd say to you is, look, you're both scared. You don't know what to do to keep this kid safe and to curb his self-destruction. His grades are in the toilet. He's getting into tr constant trouble. He's become a sullen and volatile stranger in your home. And he's saying horrible things to you. And you've begun <coughs> excuse me, to perseverate about how to help him. And you're not sleeping well at night. You find yourself at all times of the day thinking about this, thinking about how you're going to get him to change, um, who you're going to introduce him to that will be a better influence, what you can say to convince him. Um, and you and your spouse are arguing about how to handle this. And you become critical of each other because nothing seems to be working. Um, and that is the truth, that without some professional help, most parents aren't equipped to deal with this. This is not a natural parenting situation. Um, you can read the books Parenting 101, you know, How to Parent with Love and Logic, but this is really like a graduate school course on parenting when someone has a severe mental um, illness issue like a substance use disorder. Um, I already talked about searching this room and having arguments about that. And began skipping the family chores. They'd be only half done. He'd argue that cutting the yard did not include edging it. Well, it's included that for five years, but now it doesn't. And you become just exasperated. Um, you start to feel sorry for them, too, because they spend so much of their time isolated in their room, upset, um, not feeling well. You feel manipulated and unsupported by your spouse. It's really crazy making. You start to think, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? Um, he'll react with, geez, you always think I'm stoned. I'm just tired. I had a really big day of tests and um, the exams and all that concentration. I'm just tired. And then you, like a dummy, find out a week later that um, he didn't have tests that day at all. So if any of this sounds familiar, I want you to take a careful look and ask yourself, what have you been seeing that just falls within the normal tendencies of adolescent mo moodiness and pushing for independence, because that is the, that it, those are typical natural parts of the stage of life, right? Um, and there's no other time in our life that the human brain undergoes so much growth and hormone storm as in adolescence. Um, infancy is the only other time our brain goes through such rapid change. So adolescence is a time of imbalance. And I know that a certain amount of uh, 
pushback and surliness is to be expected. A certain amount of testing and rule breaking is. It's the constellation of behaviors. It's the overall picture that I want you to think about. Take a look at all the behaviors and the fallout, the things that are consequences that are naturally coming your son's or daughter's way. The grades are slipping. The, the regular friends are leaving and new friends are showing up. Um, they're late for their job. They can't get up for school. You know, they start wanting to drop out of school. They begin to obsessively argue with you about the safety, even the advisability of marijuana. Um, there was a group of kids that I met in um, treatment that wanted to make a list of things for us parents to know that we might not have ever thought about in our homes that would let us know that they were um, deeply into use and needing our help. Um, some of these things are the obvious things, you know, the uh, sleeping a lot and, um, you know, lying about where they were and um, finding things in their backpack. But here's a couple others that kind of surprised me. Missing socket wrench pieces. Hmm, socket wrench piece. Well, they were gluing these together to make pipes. Missing spoons from your kitchen and pieces of tin foil, Or oddly cut up soda cans. And the soda cans are used for making a delivery system. Um, a shooter, a bong, if you will, for uh, smoking drugs. The spoons missing is where they're cooking the heroin on the spoons um, to inject it. And the tin foil is to light the drug on fire on top of the tin foil and be able to inhale the smoke. Um, one mother told me that she'd been missing a spoon or two a week all summer, and she thought somebody was gardening with them or taking them in their car. She just didn't understand until she found a scorched one up under her son's bed. Um, a loss of interest in hobbies, truancy from school, these are all things that any of us could say, sure. Um, they may say they're going to a store or restaurant and then come back in five to ten minutes, or taking trips into the backyard repeatedly throughout the day or even into the night. You know, they stop showering, brushing their teeth, they may start digging at their skin, um, they stop shaving. They start asking for unreasonable amounts of spending money for excess gas and food. You know, I'm, I'm really hungry. Um, after soccer practice, everybody goes out to eat. And that may be true. But at the overall picture, look at the whole constellation. Um, they may be purchasing debit cards at places like Tal Target or Walmart. And then they're pawning these for drugs. Um, I mentioned the one young man that had a post office box. His mother found this odd key and I um, couldn't figure out what it was to. The screen off in the bedroom, um, slurred speech, tremors, or impaired coordination. Um, here's one. Um, being sweating, um, being bundled up and sweating on a day when they really shouldn't be cold. Wearing long sleeves in warm weather. Um, signs of withdrawal, feeling sick, vomiting. Um, saying that they have food poisoning when really it's signs of withdrawal. And they get so irritable that they just have to get out of the house. One kid likened it to my mother standing in front of the door and I can't get out of that room. It's like the oxygen is getting sucked out of the room when I really need to get high. When you think about it that way, it's no wonder that they're driven to do some pretty heinous things. And it can be very unpleasant and frightening to have this strange acting person in your home that formerly was your you know, pretty humorous and loving child. Um, drinking mouthwash or drinking Robitussin to get drunk. Um, using mouthwash all the time. Having that runny nose and cough, the chronic cough in the summer that's complaint of a sore throat, and I think I have allergies. Um, black on their teeth from smoking pills or rash on their nose or mouth um, from huffing. Um, that's inhaling um, um, and chemicals from aerosol cans. Finding aerosol cans empty in the back of the closet. Um, eating excessive amounts of candy and craving sweets way more than usual. And I already mentioned, you know, drinking large amounts of water, um, you know, when they think that you're going to be drug tested. So as I've gone through these, and you perhaps jotted some down and making note of, yeah, I think I may have seen some of that, but. Um, you know, I'm not seeing the grades are still good, the friends are still seem okay. Um, he is where I think most of the time. 
Um, but yeah, I have been finding marijuana, and now that you mention it, there is Visine in his backpack. It's not only the kids whose grades drop and become completely slovenly that are using drugs. I've met young people in treatment who maintain their high grade point average, even their school sports, um, maybe even the debate team. But their substance use was going on and they were very masterful at keeping it secret and juggling, balancing these two sides of their life. It's extremely stressful for someone to be living these two stories in their life. <clears throat> when the parents find out, um, you feel very badly about it that you really didn't realize. Um, I'm wondering if there have been any questions that have come in for me at this point, and I'm not seeing that they have. So I'm going to um, talk about your reaction as a parent, um, how you can help yourself, and how you can recognize your own constellation of behaviors, because it's not just the young person in your life that um, is undergoing this condition. The family is molded slowly and gradually. Um, as, this, as the person gets sicker, you're also doing things to adapt. Every family member plays a role. There can never be someone that is an actively using addict without someone enabling the situation and making it possible. Um, so ask yourself um, these things. Are you explaining as you're Okay, as I mentioned, some of these things to be looking out for, and you're questioning in your, your son or daughter's behavior that you're perhaps seeing these. Ask yourself, are some of these thoughts also coming up into your, coming in your head? We did it, and we're all right. And that's kind of the justifying, or the, you know, well, we did it. We smoked a little pot, and we drank when we were in high school, so, and we're okay. And as I mentioned before, these aren't, this isn't the marijuana we grew up with. This isn't the drug scene that was perhaps in our adolescence. Um, these kids are taking prescription drugs from their parents' medicine cabinets, they're mixing it, um, and they're drinking to blackout. This, they're thrill-seeking in a way that it was, it's no longer fun, it's very serious, and um, they really, this is the culture that's acceptable in most of our high schools, with some of our kids, and that's saying all. So question yourself, and you say, well, we did it, we're all right. Um, ambivalence and uncertain about what you really think about underage drinking or smoking pot. Some of us, you know, I'll admit, um, I expected that we would have to deal with marijuana and our kids at some time. There were times my husband and I had conversations about feeling a bit hypocritical because we had both smoked pot in our youth. We'd both been able to quit easily. So we questioned it. Um, I often hear parents, you know, kind of wax nostalgic about their own glory days. You know, telling fun stories about being up at Bogus Basin and having keggers and how much they got away with um, that their parents never knew about, how wasted they got at their college sorority. And doing this even in front of your children, doing this in front of them really gives them the green light. It shows them you're ambivalent, not just ambivalent, but you even approve of this. You think it's fun. Um, and so if some of that has been going on, don't beat yourself up about it, but think about it. Are you modeling the behavior you want your children to see? Are you driving home after drinks at dinner? Um, are you having parties at your home where people are getting really wasted? Um, do you come home and say things, ah, oh, got to have a drink, or thank God it's Friday, let's go have margaritas. Um, you know, these are all modeling stress relief behaviors um, about drinking. If drinking is in moderation, celebratory, um, it's not a part of every single day life, you know, um, there is modeling of drinking and keeping it, and of drinking responsibly. Um, I'm not a prohibitionist. Um, if you begin saying things like, I just feel overwhelmed, they're all doing it. What can I do about it? I'm, I just give up. Um, pretty soon she's going to be off to college anyway, so she might as well learn how to handle her liquor now that she's at home with us. And we can keep a rain on it. This is, this is okay. Um, I'll challenge you that it's not okay to be drinking. Um, alcohol before the age of 21, and illicit drugs um, are never okay, especially for a young person whose brain is so much more likely to become addicted. Um, some parents really feel like they want to maintain the peace and be their child's friend. They believe that if they confront him, he'll do it anyways, he'll hate me. Um, it's really tough to tell this kid no, he gets really angry. Um, I just want things to be peaceful in our house. I want to get along with him. I want to be his friend. Um, 
I'm going to challenge you to step up and be the parent. Um, to get more involved with these kids. Don't minimize it or keep it as a secret. Um, test repeatedly at random intervals and keep going. Um, persevere. You're going to get a lot of pushback about testing. But remember, if you aren't testing, you really don't know what's going on. Um, and if he or she continues to get stoned or drunk despite significant circumstances, despite significant consequences that you've put in their way or natural consequences that come their way, like getting kicked off of a sports team that they really loved or kicked out of school, and things are unraveling in their life, don't hold this secret um, and don't hold this secret and be in denial and shame. Reach out to resources that can help you. Um, you'll find that once you speak up, that many other people will come forward and speak to you too. Um, trust but verify. And remember, your family is not a democracy. You are the parents. You are the benevolent leader of your pack. Step up and be courageous enough to set the limits and come out of denial and um, confront your child and get them help. And um, I think that's, oh, how did you get your own into treatment? Okay, that's a great question. Um, choosing the right treatment program could be an entire another topic, but shorthand, um, we get involved with professionals and we got professional recommendations. The professionals we talked to were counselors who did specialize in addiction. Um, we talked to psychiatrists that were addictionologists. Um, this is an extra degree that most psychiatrists do not have. You can find some in Boise. We talked to um, the local treatment center and they did an intake, what do they call it, an intake assessment with our son and um, judged, well, helped us judge how severe his problem was. Did he need to go away to treatment? Um, was there any serious risk of detoxification when he stopped using his particular drug? Um, would inpatient be adequate? What kind of help might we need as parents? And then we hired something called an educational consultant, which was quite an expensive venture, but it helped us to review the um, out-of-state treatment centers because they all look wonderful on the internet. They all look like they're a country club, an outward bound course that they love their children and that they all come out cured. This is what um, they, all these sites look like. So I really advise you to get as much personal advice from professionals um, that, they, um, get, that you get as much advice from professionals and that you go to visit each of these treatment programs and you insist on speaking to other parents whose children are in the program or who have gone through the program. Uh, what if they won't go to treatment? Well, um, we did have this situation. We tried um, from many different directions to therapeutically communicate with our son, to nudge him, encourage him, positively motivate him. And that wasn't working, so we did eventually have to exert our parental authority. And um, we did take him to treatment. It wasn't his idea. How do you find a good therapist? Um, go online. Um, you can call the local treatment centers, North Point Recovery Center, the Walker Center, um, Ascend, um, Ascent Treatment Center, um, psychiatrists in town who specialize in addictionology, and when you interview a therapist, ask them, do you have experience with adolescent addiction? And then um, on my website, which is www.blindersoff.org, that's blindersoff.org, I list many of these resources, and there's many articles I've written about just this topic, and I also give you a phone number. You can contact me or write me an email. So that's all I have, and I thank you for your attention and wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Jenny. And again, we're Idaho Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, and uh, we are so grateful to have you come and um, speak to the families. Thanks for the opportunity. It's a tough situation. Mm -hmm.